good evening. Uh, I am Hugh Patrick. On behalf of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, I want to welcome you all uh, to this evening's event on corporate governance by pension funds. I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Alicia Ogawa, who is the director of the Center's project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship. Uh, she's an adjunct associate professor at the uh, Columbia uh, School of International Public Affairs, uh, known as SIPA to most people, and is a member of the International Corporate Governance Network, which I see usually is referred to as ICGN. Um, Alicia spent uh, 15 years from 1986 in Tokyo as a bank analyst and director for research at Nico Solomon Smith Barney. She then joined Lehman Brothers in New York as a managing director where she was responsible for managing the firm's global equity research. And then she took early retirement in 2006, just in time as it turned out. Uh, she, she's a member of the board of directors of the Mansfield Foundation and a member of the President's Circle on the All Stars Project, which is a development program for uh, poor young minorities. Uh, Alicia graduated from Barnard College and in due course received her master's degree in international affairs at SEPA. Uh, tonight's symposium is part of uh, CGM's corporate governance and stewardship program, which is led by Alicia, as I just mentioned. Uh, this program focuses on the analysis of the governance structure of the most innovative Japanese companies and how it has helped them to become uh, global competitors in, in, the, in the world market. Uh, through a series of public programs and papers, this program's mission is to inspire best practices among firms in Japan as they consider new approaches to governance. Uh, for this evening's program, our two distinguished speakers will discuss the importance of the role of both Japan's Pension Fund Association and the New York Pension Program in promoting better corporate governance and more sustainable business practices in their portfolio companies. As you probably know, uh, in Japan, corporate governance and the stewardship code have been given uh, emphasis by Prime Minister uh, Abe in deciding to use them as means for stimulating corporate investment and uh, achieving stable economic growth. So it's a high priority, or at least allegedly a high priority in, in Japanese policy. Uh, Alicia will formally introduce our speakers. Uh, just one note before we uh, begin the program, please put your phones on hold or quiet or whatever it is that prevents us from being dis disturbed by them. Now I'll turn the mic over to Alicia Ogawa. Thanks for that kind introduction, Professor Patrick. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm very, very, very excited to be here tonight for two reasons. First of all, the oversight of publicly traded companies uh, has become a topic of crucial importance given the increasing number of corporate shenanigans uh, from Japanese companies such as Toshiba, Takata, Kobe Steel, to US companies such as Wells Fargo, Equifax, Harvey Weinstein's Miramax, companies seem unable to behave themselves. I recently uh, tried to make a one-page chart listing only the cases that had occurred in, the, in both countries in the past year, and uh, three pages later, uh, I still hadn't finished. So I don't know what's going on, um, but um, in addition to putting the lives of consumers at risk, uh, the conduct of these firms has cost their shareholders lots of money. Uh, of course, shareholders are ultimately all of us. We are all individuals who are investing our money to secure a comfortable retirement, to save for our children's education, and so on. And so how well institutional investors police the companies that they invest in, how they put pressure on managements to fight corruption and waste has become a global topic of great urgency. The second reason I'm excited is because with us tonight, we have two gentlemen who are leaders in fighting that fight. In a sense, they're fighting that fight for all of us. 
and they are both true standard bearers in this space. Uh, so about Mr. Garland first. The New York City public pension system is the fourth largest public pension fund in the United States, managing more than $170 billion. And the controller's office has long been a leader in campaigning for better management of the companies in which it invests. The controller's office has fought successfully for market-wide reforms, such as proxy access, and the office has also been joining forces with other investors to champion shareholder pr proposals at specific firms. Our speaker, Mike Garland, will tell us more about that. He's been in charge of corporate governance and responsible investment for New York City for about eight years. Uh, he became involved with corporate governance while he was working at the AFL-CIO's office in investment at the time of the Enron crisis. Japan's PFA is a unique institution, not only because of its structure, but because of its fierce independence. Since pension funds in Japan are not portable, employees who leave the companies they work at before retirement have their pensions turned over to the Pension Fund Association for management. For example, I left the firm I worked for in Tokyo um, when I was transferred back to New York City, and my Japanese pension account was turned over to the Pension Fund Association. So, Hokugo-san, please be good to me. <laughs> for more than 15 years, the Pension Fund Association has been challenging the status quo in Japan, proposing many new measures to create more transparency and more accountability at Japanese firms. They've really not been afraid to break glass. And I think you will understand that, that very clearly from Mr. Hokugo's presentation. Mr. Hokugo is now head of corporate governance at Pension Fund Association, and he is also in charge of the fund's investment in the hedge fund portfolio. He's practically a New Yorker, having been spent 15 years working for Sumitomo Mitsui Bank Corporation's New York office, and most importantly, he is a graduate of Columbia Business School. So uh, the format is each of the speakers will speak for about 20 minutes. Please hold your questions until the end of the two presentations. We'll have a Q&A session before the reception begins. While Japan and the US face many of the same challenges in fostering better stewardship by asset managers, the regulatory, legal, and cultural environment in which they operate is quite different. So I'm sure these two gentlemen will give you many things to think about and many things to ask questions about. So I will now turn the, uh, the floor over to Mr. Garland and uh, remind you of Professor Patrick's request to turn your phones on silent. Thank you very much. Mr. Garland. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Alicia, and uh, good evening, everybody. I look forward to sharing some perspectives on uh, pension funds as a force for good governance and particularly uh, describe a little bit about the activities of the New York City pension funds. Let me make sure I have the uh, technology down. Okay. How many people here are familiar with the Wells Fargo fake account scandal? I see a show of hands. Great. So, let me tell you a little background for those of you who may not know. Last September, in September 2016, Wells Fargo agreed to pay $185 million to settle uh, allegations that uh, it had been opened hundreds of thousands of fake accounts over a period of many years. So what happened is salespeople would open an account and quickly close it so that they could get hit their cross-selling target. And over 5,300 people were fired for committing fraud. And within four weeks of this announcement, Wells Fargo share price uh, fell 13%. And I think the harm, the uh, reputational harm, we're still living with. And uh, you know, a quick comment about the underlying what went wrong there. The people who committed fraud, if you commit fraud, you should be fired. But in many ways, they were victims. There were low-level employees put in an impossible position. Either they fail to hit overly aggressive sales targets and they lose their job, or they commit fraud and they get caught and they get fired and they lose their job. And ultimately, this was a failure at the top. 
failure of tone at the top, a failure of the board, a failure of leadership that this went on for a very long time. And they knew that it was happening, but they didn't understand that it was systemic. People would be fired, but they didn't really understand that there was a systemic failure. So that was on September 8th. On September 22nd, two weeks later, Scott Stringer, the New York City Comptroller, sent a letter on behalf of the New York City Pension Funds to the board of Wells Fargo. And it called on the board to claw back compensation from two top executives responsible for uh, the crisis and for the, the settlement. And in the letter, we said, we estimate that approximately $19 million in total incentive paid to Kerry Tolstead, who ran the consumer banking unit, and approximately $41 million in total incentive compensation paid to Mr. Stump is eligible to be clawed back, for the, them to take that money back. And you have a responsibility to enforce your policy. Five days later, there was an announcement that Wells Fargo clawed back $41 million from John Stump, $19 million from Carrie Tolstack. Now, let me stay here a minute. Now, how did we understand this policy? And, and what, you know, we didn't just come out of nowhere to send the letter. I want to take you back to 2013 when former controller John Liu was controller. And at that time, under his leadership, we engaged a bunch of banks, including Wells Fargo, around strengthening the policy, giving the board the authority to claw back pay from executives responsible for misconduct. And this was informed by the notion that we came through a financial crisis where no senior executives were held accountable. Shareholders got left holding the bag for excessive risk taking, in some cases misconduct. We paid the price and executives uh, didn't feel it in their pocketbook or, or in their job. And the notion of a clawback for misconduct is really about setting the tone at the top. If you can be held financially accountable, you have a financial incentive to ensure ethical conduct and, and good compliance. And that's you know, one example, I think, of pension funds having an impact on corporate governance. I want to tell you a little bit about <coughs> the New York City pension funds and who we are, and, and, and a little more broadly about our activism, and then highlight some of our current initiatives. So as Alicia mentioned, we're the fourth largest pension system uh, in, in the country, and now we're up to $186 billion in assets. Broadly diversified, but half of the portfolio, and, and we're a system of five pension funds. Uh, we have a, representing fire, police, teachers, uh, board of education is the non-pedagogical employees of the school system, and then everybody else, uh, which is in NICERS. And this chart, which shows the assets, is, is the five systems collectively. Of that $187 billion or so, roughly half is invested in public equity. We own over 10,000 companies around the world. We have about 3,500 companies here in the US. We have about $5 billion invested in Japan, about 1,500 public companies in the Japanese market. And we are a long-term owner. We're a long-term owner for two reasons. A, our actuarial time horizon, for investing to pay benefits for uh, people who may retire 30 years down the road, but also our investment strategy. Here in the US, over 80% of our public equity is invested through index strategies. So if we have concerns with the quality of a board, a company's environmental practices, a company's workplace practices, business strategy, we can't do what's called the Wall Street walk and walk away. So the only way we can protect and create value is to actively engage our portfolio companies. And New York City has a very long and proud history of engaging on a very broad range of issues from workplace discrimination, protecting the rights of uh, LGBT employees in the workplace, board of director independence, executive compensation. Uh, you know, I, I could go on and on. And we use various tools, shareholder proposals. We're the most active filer of shareholder proposals in the world. Uh, we collaborate. We're a co-founder of the Council of Institutional Investors. We are committed to leadership and collaboration. I want to talk a little bit about our most recent initiative, which we launched in 2014, in fall of 2014, called the Boardroom Accountability Project. Now, 
Well, it's probably quite a few people know. How many people in the room know what proxy access is? Wow, that's impressive. So proxy access is the right for shareholders <coughs> to nominate directors on the company's ballot. Here in the United States, if there's a 10-member board, when we open up the proxy statement and look at the ballot, there are 10 nominees. And the 10 who get the, the most votes get elected. So if you're a director and you own one share and you vote for yourself and everyone else votes against you, you're still elected. Now, investors have the legal right, like the Carl Icahn, to challenge the board, but it costs millions of dollars. They have to have their own ballots, send all their own materials. It's very costly. What proxy access does is it provides eligible shareholders, and the way we define it, substantial long-term holders, the right to nominate some directors on the company's ballot. It's not a tool to take over or influence control of a company. It's a way of putting genuinely independent directors on a corporate board. In the wake of Enron, uh, in 2002 or so, the SEC proposed a proxy access rule that would give that right to investors at all US companies. The Business Roundtable and Chamber of Commerce threatened to sue the SEC and they never moved forward. After the financial crisis, once again, the SEC proposed a rule. This was a response to give investors more influence about the board. And there's nothing more important than who sits on the board of, of a company. To inoculate the SEC from litigation, the Dodd-Frank Act has a provision that affirmed that the SEC had the authority to implement the rule. The SEC implemented the rule, and for one month, we had proxy access at every US company. But lo and behold, the Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce sued anyway, and they won on procedural grounds. And so we lost that fight. And what we came out of it with was the right to ask company by company for proxy access rights. That was 2011, 2012. And after a couple years of waiting for the SEC to reissue its rule, we got frustrated and said, this isn't going to happen. Uh, company by company efforts were going very slowly. The resistance from uh, our portfolio companies was, was significant, to say the least. And this is about changing the power relationships in the corporate boardroom. And so in the fall of 2014, within a period of two weeks, and we announced it publicly at the end of those two weeks, we submitted proposals seeking proxy access to 75 companies. We identified those companies based on companies with significant exposure to climate change risk, so our most carbon intensive energy companies, companies that lacked adequate racial or gender diversity in their boardroom, and companies with a history of excessive CEO pay. But I should note, we want this right at all companies. That was sort of prioritizing some fundamental risks that we didn't think boards were taking seriously enough. At the time, there were six US companies that had meaningful proxy access rights in their, uh, in, in their bylaws. Today, there are 443 US companies with proxy access. Over 60% of the S&P 500, um, one third of those companies are in direct response to a shareholder proposal that New York City submitted over the past several years. But I would argue, and I don't think it's being hyperbolic, that none of this would have happened had it not <coughs> broke through with the project. And we collaborated with other investors and received a lot of support from CalPERS and other US pension funds and some global pension funds like, like Norges Bank as well. So phase two, in September of this year, now that we've sort of won the war on proxy access, we want to test the theory of proxy access. I should be clear, the way proxy access has been implemented at these companies, shareholders who've held 3% for three years have the right to nominate up to 20% or 25% of the board. We're the fourth largest pension system in the country. We rarely have more than a half percent of any portfolio company. It's not an easy right to use. It isn't going to be used frequently. It's going to take, I think, a significant crisis to galvanize investors. But the theory is the specter of a proxy access nominee, the risk, will cause directors to be more responsive to their investors on whatever our concerns are, up to and including, and most importantly, the composition of the board. And so what we have done uh, in, in September, Controller Stringer 
sent a letter to 150 companies that had enacted proxy access over the past three years in response to New York City's proposals. And we said, we want to talk to the chair of your nominating committee of the board, not management, but the board. And we want to understand how you identify directors. How do you refresh the board? Do you have processes in place to get directors who shouldn't be there anymore off the board? How do you use search firms? And how do you look for diversity in, in your board? And, and diversity of skills and experience, but also explicitly diversity of race, ethnicity, and gender. And we said, as a predicate to this discussion, we want you to give to us and to share with all shareholders a skills and experience matrix of your board. And you can, you can define what dimensions are in that matrix. So if you think marketing expertise is important, that can be one dimension, and, and you would just check which directors had marketing expertise, um, international expertise. That's up to the board. Let us know what's important. But there are two dimensions that ought to be included in every matrix, and that's the race slash ethnicity of directors and the, um, the gender. Because unless you tell us, we don't know. And a lot of companies, they don't even put pictures in. I, I will say with gender diversity, there's guesswork, but you can get it right about 98% of the time because of names and other things. But beyond that, um, when it comes to, to race and ethnicity, we, we really, we, we don't know. And uh, so let me just see where I am here. Um, so we sent the letter in <coughs> early September. We vote already, as of two weeks ago, we heard from about 102 companies. And I would say that's preliminarily, and we've, at minimum, they've acknowledged the response. We've had <coughs> maybe dozens of initial engagements with management, hopefully on a pathway toward engagement with the board. These are very resource intensive engagements because they're based on what the company's already disclosing to shareholders. So um, we, we've bitten off uh, a lot. I have a colleague who didn't quite realize how high the response rate would be, but we, there was self-selection involved because we, we had talked to these companies over the past three years. And you know, we'll see come proxy season, which in this country is in next spring, uh, what has changed in terms of disclosure. I am confident we will change disclosure practices broadly. I am hopeful that we change behavior, because I think that's ultimately what it is that, that we're seeking to do. Um, and you know, I look forward to talking more about it. And, and thank you, Alicia. But these are, uh, I think, two of our most impactful uh, initiatives in recent years. Mr. Hokugo from Pension Fund Association of Japan. Yes, I'm very honored to be here as a uh, graduate of uh, CBS. Um, Professor Patrick hasn't aged a day, so I'm pretty <laughs> impressed. Um, my name is Ken Hokugo and, uh, of, uh, from the Pension Fund Association of Japan. Uh, as uh, Alicia explained earlier, uh, so, uh, you know, Pension Fund Association, or PFA, is, uh, despite the name association, is actually the third largest uh, public pension fund of Japan. With uh, AUM is of uh, approximately 100 billion US dollars. Uh, so today's uh, topic is uh, power to the pension. So um, my presentation is of course about Japan and uh, you know the asset owners in Japan are significantly underserved and much more so than what uh, you may know, you may or you may not know or have heard. Uh, Japan is very, very far from here. And I know that you have, uh, you know, <coughs> news from uh, from Japan, but uh, from uh, what I understand, uh, the uh, news is, uh, you know, telling you only the rosy picture, and uh, probably, you know, it, some of the very important um, flaws or the uh, shortcomings uh, must be lost in translation. So. Uh, let's get, oh, long, long time. Uh, clearly, I'm a fan of Star Wars, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next slide is, um, this is a you know, fantastic uh, you know, uh, historical perspective, but uh, you know, we'll go through this slide very pretty quickly. 
Uh, Japan is a very, very old country, and uh, thousands of businesses have a uh, you know, um, history of longer than 200 years. Uh, and, uh, so, um, so in short, when we talk to those uh, old school, big uh, Japanese companies, uh, they typically would say, I've never tried this before, but they would typically say that, um, you know, hey, kid, we have grown and uh, survived and flourished for 300 years or years. And who are you to tell us how to run the business? So uh, in general, Japanese companies has a slightly different perspective about the sustainability and, of course, governance. And please, uh, you know, Remember this, uh, you know, one page. This is sort of a yeah, um, Japanese business culture for dummies. This is the starting point of understanding corporate governance in Japan. So, next uh, is uh, yeah, New Hope. All right, and sure, there was is was uh, is a New Hope uh, in Japan, which emerged in 2014, as uh, Professor Patrick mentioned a little bit uh, before. In 2014, the first stewardship code was introduced. This was the first in Asia back then. And the following year, uh, 2015, the first corporate governance code was introduced. So those two are often referred to as uh, the twin engine of the um, makeover of Japanese corporate governance included in the last of the three arrows you know, the growth strategy in the Japan revitalization strategy initiated by Prime Minister Abe. Uh, the next uh, two, uh, you know, blood point is a little bit uh, so cynical, but uh, so I don't want to, you know, read this. But uh, anyhow, the, you know, some media say that those calls made a tremendous difference. Uh, it is. I admit, true, that uh, corporate started to meeting more often with uh, shareholders, uh, which is a, you know, engagement. But uh, you know, whether they're seriously listening, or uh, they're uh, taking seriously our advice is question. So my last comment is really. So this slide comes uh, from the, uh, my last comments, uh, really. And uh, there are flows, uh, you know, fundamental flows uh, you know, which many of you may not be aware of. These are the flows um, by which the asset owners like us, uh, the, our power has been significantly constrained. Uh, you know, it is like uh, being told to eat while uh, one hand being tie, uh, tied up on, on our back. So that's really uh, not, uh, you know, perfect. Um, so on this slide, you have to remember just two things. One, you know, collective engagement. Collective engagement is, as you may know, it's uh, engagement uh, uh, um, with uh, collaboration with other investors. So the multiple investors go together, uh, engage with uh, one company. And this collective engagement is not explicitly encouraged by the uh, regulators or the stewardship code. But when the stewardship code of Japan was introduced in 2014. It was the first in Asia. But uh, today, several Asian countries have its own uh, stewardship code, and which does have a uh, you know, blessing for the collective engagement, explicitly encourage collective, uh, collective engagement. So um, it is a very unique situation where the uh, Japanese stewardship code may be the only stewardship code in the world that does not explicitly encourage uh, co uh, collective engagement. And number two, the allegiant shareholders. You know, allegiant shareholders is the words that I made up. And uh, it's, you know, the reason for why I named it, I, I would explain later, but uh, the, in, you know, there was the article on Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, uh, which uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter interviewed us, and uh, you know, they uh, used this word on the Wall Street Journal. So I hope you're going to use this word too. And uh, that is a very uh, accurate, uh, you know, uh, expression of what the situation of, of those uh, shareholders. So these two uh, problems, collective engagement as well as allegiance shareholders, 
they are not separated. They are very uh, intertwined, very closely related. And uh, let's go through this uh, slide. Uh, you know, collective engagement is absolutely essential to get minority holders like pension funds or foreign investors heard or taken seriously. Why? Because significant shares are often held by the stable shareholders who always votes for the management. Okay, shareholders for the management. They are called allegiant shareholders because of that. Um, you wonder why uh, you know, the, the, those people are hold other companies' shares. It is, uh, it is simple and it, it makes perfectly, uh, it perfectly makes sense in the uh, very old culture or developing culture. They, they hold their shares in order to get business. You know, it's just like an you know, entry ticket. It, it, you know, if you buy our shares, I will do business with you. The purpose is, of course, they want more stable shareholders in order to not to have to worry about AGM um, and voting. So the recent uh, example is, uh, you may remember that the Toyota and the Mazda uh, announced a new joint venture. And, uh, you know, it was good. I mean, you know, they're going to uh, work together, Japanese company, Japanese company, that, that, that's fine. But uh, probably most of the people didn't uh, have pay any attention to the latter parts. They also agreed to buy each other's shares. Toyota agreed to pay 5% of the Mazda's shares. And Mazda was, uh, 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 you know, agreed to pay, um, you know, buy the Toyota share at the, about the same amount. You know, as a corporate governance uh, person, I scratch my head. Why do they have to buy each other's shares? You know, if, you, they, if you, they want to do the business together, they just sign the documents but they do exchange shares because, of course, they want to <coughs> make more stable shareholders who, want, who will definitely not sell and vote yes at uh, you know, AGMs. Okay, so the magnitude of cross shareholding, um, I will uh, you know, go, go this uh, page a little bit uh, quick. Uh, the one study shows that on average, 35 to 40 percent of all the shares companies are held by those allegiant shareholders. Uh, this is a scientifically, uh, you know, the, the research uh, by statistics. Those breakdown: insurance companies, five percent; banks, five percent; and companies, 25 percent. Companies include trading companies, the carriers companies, the world's largest group companies, suppliers, distributors, funders, family office, etc. Why, for example, insurance companies have to hold the shares of the other companies? The good example is, let's say, insurance companies. They have to own the odd maker's shares. <coughs> Otherwise, the data network of that certain odd maker will, not, will never carry the insurance of those insurance companies. So that's why they hold own their shares. And let's compare this uh, number, 35 to 40 percent, excluding retail uh, shareholders uh, with the other com countries. U.S., U.K., typically less than 10 percent, and continent Europe, uh, 10 to 20 percent. So, jet, so the, the figures in Japan is close to the level of some of the emerging market, I have to say. So the nature of allegiant shareholders, I have explained that this is a for business and blah, blah, blah. But uh, you know, the, uh, the impact of the allegiant shareholders is much more powerful than you may think. Um, you know, um, the, uh, taking into account those held by the retail investors, uh, which was not included in the numbers of the previous page, uh, the food, those retail investors typically submit blank, pro blank proxy when it comes to voting at AGM. We estimate about 70% of the retail investors just sent, sent in the blank uh, proxies. So the management in advance know that they would always win. The, you know, the job of the, uh, uh, say, general affairs uh, department is to count the poll, count the, you know, vote and they will make sure that they win at uh, any items uh, discussed in the AGM. So 
there's no uh, need to worry about the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the management of personal positions or even the post-retirement positions at the company. And also there's no need for the management to worry about the takeover and no need to worry about the uh, electing family, friends as the outside directors and also no need to worry about the uh, not taking risk or the paying too high a price for M&A. So there's no wonder ROE of the Japanese companies are very low. And lastly, uh, but not least, and, uh, you know, there's no need to worry about accountability, strategies, or leadership quality, or lack thereof. So it's a very well-made system, and uh, you know, as, you, as I, you know, I didn't write there, but uh, uh, you know, the truth is, how many CEOs has been fired by the uh, you know shareholders' proposal? Almost none. And how many uh, directors has been uh, in elected by the shareholder proposal? There's uh, only one, which happened just uh, this year. So, you know, unlike uh, U.S., there's an interesting uh, situation. Unlike the U.S. You know where the uh, you know strategic shareholder is usually one company. They they hold a uh, huge amount of the uh, shares because of the strategic reason, the true strategic reasons. They may want to acquire that company in the future, or they may decide that uh, this is not going to be going to work. So <coughs> they just uh, you know abandon the, the, the shares. They they buy the one company by the bulk of the shares to secure the position to consider that the possibility. But in Japan, you know, those uh, 35, 40 percent shares are held by more than hundreds or hundreds of companies. So here, uh, you know, this, uh, but this makes a perfect sense in Japanese uh, bad tradition uh, system. So I, again, call it the Japanese collective irresponsible system. Okay, so yeah, corporate empire strikes back, of course. Uh, oh. They are totally defensive against the takeover threats, and uh, they now have made sure these incidents do not happen again. So they made sure, uh, they lobbied to the government to make sure that they make the laws and uh, uh, you know, those uh, collective engagement doesn't happen or something like that. So, uh, you know, the... Uh, also, the, uh, I, 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 really, uh, I realize that, that there is the uh, you know, belief, a rumor uh, in your head that uh, the corporate Japan's uh, cross-holding is uh, you know, getting better and even that the level is less than 10%. But that uh, report is based upon the, uh, well, or the fact, but uh, it's there is a very, very fine print under that. They just counted uh, the listed companies' official filing Official filing requests uh, just to list the top 30 holdings, while the, uh, many of the companies, like uh, banks, have uh, 3,000 uh, names, and the security companies uh, hold 900 names. And, uh, you know, this is uh, that's very, very, very misleading information. So uh, the time is getting tight, and uh, the uh, returns of the shareholders, right? This. Uh, um, yeah, as a conclusion, I want to connect the lack of power uh, granted to asset owners and the governance-related events you see more and more recently and more frequently, uh, like a Toshiba you mentioned, and uh, Takata, Kobe, and uh, you know, why these things keep happening. So without power, uh, we, asset owners, cannot help uh, Jap uh, corporate Japan get better. So the, uh, the results, What's, what happens? That there are two uh, folds. Nullifying the fundamental function of a normal sound, uh, stock market. And the, and the number two, uh, serious conflicts of interest between alleged shareholders and in this, uh, institutional investors. There is a company act and which has a principle uh, to treat the shareholders equally. Uh, while the alleged shareholders uh, get business, makes money, the uh, uh, institutional investor or asset owners like us just get dividends. So they do not uh, treat all the shareholders equally. So that's, that's, that's the problem. And uh, last slide, what can be done? Okay, 
Um, the, this is what we propose for what can and should be done. Uh, right now, good news is that the COVID governance code seems to be, uh, even though just for the sake of appearance, uh, you know, changing the company's behavior, meeting more uh, often with the shareholders. Uh, bad news is it still probably take a decade. Uh, for example, banks promise the FSA to sell their uh, you know, um, strategic holding for a third in five years meaning it takes 15 years or more to get rid of all the, uh, those strategic holdings. So we need a global coordination push, institutional investors or even the government level pressure is needed. I believe this is going to bring a win-win situation for Japanese investors as well as the foreign investors who can uh, access the open market and buy the shares and um, sometimes the foreign companies can you know, buy, acquire the Japanese company, which is not happening very often unless that company is getting into the big trouble like a Toshiba, uh, Sharp, or a Takata, or this kind of thing. So, uh, Mr. Garland, you can you know, help us to push the government, uh, push the business community to uh, change things. So, um, that's it for my presentation. And uh, you know, this is not exaggeration. I just, uh, you know, here to tell the uh, fact about the Japanese market. Thank you very much. In listening to these two presentations, um, I'm, all, I'm, I'm reminded of something that I always read about, which is that in the case of Japan, the legal system really grants shareholders enormous rights yeah. uh, compared to the United States. You have the right to um, suggest dividend policy, the right to call special meetings, you, enormous rights. And the problem in Japan is that shareholders don't exercise those rights because many of them are so-called allegiant shareholders, to use Mr. Hokugo's term, which I think is a very, very um, descriptive one, um, because of these kind of old friendships between Japanese companies and their suppliers and their customers. In the case of the United States, it seems that it's sort of the opposite is true, that shareholders have to fight for their rights, um, and yet the shareholders are very incentivized to do so. So you have two systems kind of after the same aim, but approaching it with very different backgrounds. Um, I'd like to just kick off the discussion with asking a question that um, I've recently been asked to present about, and I think it's a very interesting question, which is, how do you know good corporate governance when you see it? And how do you measure it? Uh, there are many papers I've read about the United States which suggest that corporate governance is kind of a neutral, like the absence of lawsuits and you know, compliance issues is, is, is what corporate governance is for. Um, I'm sure you don't agree with that. <laughs> But again, how do we measure the effectiveness of good governance? In the case of Japan, I think um, the Prime Minister had several very specific goals. One was um, to use investor pressure to get Japanese companies to spend the enormous amounts of cash they have on their balance sheets, it's like 140% of GDP or something, um, to uh, incentivize shareholders to press for more diversity, especially hiring of women, um, and to press, um, to get shareholders to press for more investment um, in the domestic economy in terms of capital and, capital and equipment. Um, so that's his definition of success. I think whether we're talking about Japan or the US, it's rather an individual thing. It, de it depends on where you sit and what your label is, whether you're an employee or whether you're a shareholder or whether you're a public pension official. In my case, I think I would consider Japan corporate governance reforms to be successful when you see much more liquidity of top management. When Japanese companies are willing and able, very willing and able, to hire the best person for the job rather than just dealing with people who are in the lifetime employment system. But I'm sure you have your own views, Hokugo-san, about what is, a, what is the good measure of, of corporate governance, and I'm sure you do, Mr. Garland, as well. So may I ask you guys to comment on how do we measure the effectiveness of good corporate governance? How do you know it when you see it? Um, perhaps I could ask you to s start, Mr. Garland, because you're next to me. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Alicia. It's an interesting question. 
I think you know good corporate governance when you see it, but let's try and unpack it a little bit. I think the um, expectation is that good corporate governance will lead to uh, more sustainable value creation, but at minimum, it's good risk management. Right? So uh, you try and good corporate governance means aligning the incentives of management with the incentives of shareholders. So having a well structured, uh, well structured executive compensation. A lot of corporate governance policies and practices are to uh, maximize the likelihood that the board will act independently and have good processes. Ultimately, what's most important is who's on the board, but you can have structures in place uh, to, to try and enhance the functioning of the board. And then, what are your rights when everything goes wrong? Right? So do you have the right to go into court in any state as a shareholder. You know, many companies in the United States have adopted what's called an exclusive forum provision, where if you want to sue them, you have to do it in Delaware. And so one shareholder might go into court in Delaware, an unsophisticated shareholder with bad counsel, and we might be a much larger shareholder and um, maybe in, in a better position to manage complex litigation, but we were shut out and we can't file in another jurisdiction or the company may uh, proactively take some legal action and go into a friendly jurisdiction. So I, I think that um, you're tr at minimum it's risk management and ensuring that you have your rights when you need them. And hopefully when, when things are aligned, that, that leads to, to value creation. The more I hear Mr. Garland, I feel that uh, Japan is maybe 100 steps behind. Uh, we are not there yet. I mean, um, when I see you know, the good governance uh, company, uh, that means uh, we see the company with the uh, CEO or the management accountable for it, uh, companies to return, which I don't see often. Uh, you know, I use the words that uh, collectively responsible system and uh, those uh, lifetime employment uh, system, uh, those management people have uh, you know, climbed up the ladder among, uh, after the very fierce competition with uh, you know, peers and uh, they want to enjoy the, well, quiet life. And uh, you know, they want to stay there, just stay there. And, uh, the higher you go, and the less you understand what is going on in the company. That is the truth. So uh, we need a remuneration system or incentive, incentive system that let the CEO to become accountable and to take risks. Uh, you know, the reason why there are a lot of cash in Japanese companies uh, balance sheet is because they don't want to take risk. Um, they don't want to borrow money because the borrowing money means uh, there is a possibility for the uh, bankruptcy so, or default. So they don't want to borrow money, so they want to uh, uh, you know, accumulate cash for the emergency purposes, so that they, that's what they say. So um, you know, they need incentive to take a risk and uh, go uh, and raise the ROE number. So we need, uh, like I said, the accountable CEO and the incentive system for the management and uh, right remuneration system for the CEO. And then that's the only time I see a, uh, this company is really trying to be a good governance company. Um. I just have two follow-up comments before we open up for questions. And to Okugo-san, I would say, um, of all the investors I try to engage on this question, they say what, kind of what you said, you know, better CEO performance and evaluation. They want to see more board evaluation, independent board evaluation. They want to see better market share, increasing market share of the companies that used to be great. They want to see better ROE, better ROIC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the, the, the other comment I have for Mr. Garland is um, I like your comment very much about 
matching the incentives of management with investors, but that sort of begs the question of the multiplicity of investors that you have. And you know, this debate in America, which is so different from Japan, is about short-termism versus long-termism. And um, I want to share with you a nice um, anecdote about a uh, discussion I had with a Japanese CEO who said, I think the loveliest image um, I've, I've heard about this, he said, well, when he's dealing with shareholders, different types of shareholders, he regards himself as, the, as a hotel. And he has to welcome short-term stays and long-term stays. And you know, you actually want repeat performance of the short-termers who come and go and come and go. And you really value your long-term uh, shareholders. But I, I like that image very much.